Okay, you ready? Sure. A Swift Kicking Ass, episode 36. Welcome to a Swift Kicking the Ass podcast, hosted by lifelong friends Tom Stewart and John Curran. Today's episode is a special feature covering Robert Green's 48 Laws of Power. Welcome, I'm Tom Stewart. I'm joined with my childhood friend who I've known for over 40 years, my friend John Curran. How are you doing, John? Doing great, Tom. How are you? Good. Today we're going to talk once more about Robert Greene's best-selling book, The 48 Laws of Power. And today we're up to law number 22. Use surrender, the use the surrender tactic. Transform weakness into power. When you're weaker, never fight for honor's sake. Choose surrender instead. Surrender gives you time to recover, time to torment and irritate your conqueror. Time to wait for his power to wane. Do not give him the satisfaction of fighting and defeating you. Surrender first. By turning the other cheek, you infuriate and unsettle him. Make surrender a tool of power. You just love that, don't you, Tom? You, I love the word to, power. And to infuriate them and confuse them. And I, you know, I um I love this law myself. You know, I uh, I know on our show that we often talk about where people are in their quest for power. Are they just, you know, are they just starting out, uh, starting to, you know, accumulate some power in their lives or are they trying to maintain it? You know, uh, and I think that this law addresses, um, addresses any, any place where you are on that spectrum. And it, it's really a folk. Um, it's really focusing on the decision-making process that leads to action. Cause it's, as you said, it, it's, you can't win every battle, uh, and no, and sometimes you need to 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 walk away. And I think this is, you know, this tactic and and saying surrender gives you um, it gives you time to recoup, to to strengthen yourself, and come back stronger. It, related to the law of fifteen, you know, if you want to crush the enemy. Sometimes you're not powerful enough to to crush the enemy. Uh, looking back at at the United States and the Revolutionary War, we had to use guerrilla warfare because the British forces were such so large, and there was no way we could beat them by their own rules. So we created our own rules and uh, dispersed, you know, dispersed our forces um, to gain an advantage. You know, what's funny is um, I've been listening to uh, Hardcore History, which is uh, Dan Carlin's famous podcast, and he was talking about the um, the Mongols and with uh, Genghis mm-hmm. Khan. And one of the tactics, you know, because back in the old days, a lot of the warfare happened, you know, one army met on one side of the field, one army met on the other, and all their thousands of people were waiting ready to battle, where where the Mongols fought more almost like a the Americans did against the, the British. They did more guerrilla war- warfare and they would come from all angles. They would surround them, yeah. you know, and they were so quick and light and traveled so fastly that they'd be armies that outnumbered them by like 40, yeah. 40 to 60,000 men. Yeah. You know, it keeps them, it keeps your enemy off. It takes your enemy off guard. I mean, look at the game of Thrones. I know that this tech, I mean, the, uh, the, the guerrilla warfare was, was used because, um, he was one of the bastards. Gosh, that limits limits the characters, doesn't it? I'm terrible at character names, but basically, the army was camped. Um, they're waiting for the, you know, it was it, there was too much snow on the ground to go in, so they couldn't sneak. You know, they out they were outnumbered, so they snuck in just a few men into camp at night and burned up all of their provisions and um, took their ammo or, or whatever. I mean, they 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 damaged the enemy by using a very small force and they came in in the middle of the night and they did their damage and they left, uh, right. left on a, right. that was the bastard son, you know, that yeah. when they, you know, they had uh, already taken over Winterfell and they, um, they, uh, I can't think of his name either, but the guy it was wasn't snow. Out. Yeah. It was, the uh, guy with the, the, the witch, you know, where she abandoned him and, uh, you know, they, I thought it was, uh, it was someone else anyhow oh maybe we're talking about two different parts of the yeah i think we're t- that's okay because 
just, just takes us way off topic to talk about games <laughs> game of thrones um you know i think that uh we can apply this this law stannis. about i was thinking of stannis, stannis that was right. his name stannis well, stannis it was wasn't him winterfell and the, the bastard son went in with 20 men remember and he burned up the horses and the food and let the horses go and then the next morning half his troops left because they were they were discouraged right anyhow Let's get back on track, man. <laughs> I, don't, uh, I love talking Games of Thrones, and, and I think we'll have a, a special Game of Thrones episode, absolutely, just so it's we rife. can just so it's we rife. can do this. Um, so, anyhow, it, Law Twenty Two and using the surrender tactic, I real and you know, transforming weakness into power. Now, I, if you think about it, uh, weakness or strength is very relative. We and we'll use the ant for the for this example. Uh, for their size, they are one of the strongest creatures around, very strong. But we can step on them with ease, and especially if they're red and they they try to bite you, uh, which I just happened to me today. <laughs> but you know, it, it it strength and weakness is relative. The ant is is strong for their size, um, and and we have. Uh, we all have our own strengths and weaknesses, but you know, are they really weaknesses, um, or is it just something that maybe other people do do better? Like I felt that way when I when I played the saxophone in in uh, in band in high school. I I could play okay, but there were so many people that were better than me, and it was not my strength. And then I switched to play bass guitar, something I really loved, really enjoyed, and. Uh, and I continue playing to this day. So it's it, it, that's fun for me. That's, I had to let that weakness go. That's interesting because, you know, one of the reasons that I quit band, I, I too played saxophone, if you remember. Right. And I I used to have to push. Somehow I, I got where they needed someone to push the amplifier for the guy that was playing the bass guitar. It wasn't you. It was uh, one of your buddies. And so basically I couldn't play. I had to march behind this guy pushing his bass guitar amp and you know they're marching like so you, an idiot pushing a little hand truck and so you like, surrendered I was like, yeah i was like this sucks <laughs> i'm quitting yeah that you were a year behind me so yeah i had already left i mean can you uh, imagine today that, that happening and you know some parent would be like my son's not gonna push a bit well, you know back when i was a kid I, I didn't say anything my parents probably didn't had no idea and it just came home. It was just day, cool was to like, have a bass guitar on the on the football field. Not not, playing, not, if, you're, playing, not uh, if you're marching behind the amp, it was it. You know what? Honestly, it wasn't that much fun marching in front of it because um I forget the guy's name, but he 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 wasn't paying attention. He almost mowed me over <laughs> <laughs> with the cart. I was playing my bass and and just knocked almost knocked me over on my face. I was so mad. But anyhow, we're gonna get get through this one way or the other right, so um, when we talk about surrender you, you know one one vision that comes to mind for me is in a hurricane right in a hurricane the biggest strongest trees always get uprooted you know if you have an oak tree or you know a ficus tree they, they're gone the next day they're broken because they're so stiff they don't yield but however if you have a palm tree the palm tree bends and flexes you know, same thing like the willow, the willow. And, yeah. And it survives. And if you ever seen palm trees, they, they bend like, you know, you would think they would break, but they're flexible and they yield, they yield to the stronger force and they survive. And it's the same thing yeah. as this law. And, and if you're not a tree and, and we could still bend. In fact, I was, I was thinking that, um, you know, our educational system, always tries to to make our weaknesses stronger like if we're a bad at math you have to work extra hard to 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 get stronger to pass the you know to pass the test and get the test scores that the school is looking for but you know in the real world what we what i think we should really do and there's actually a a book you can um get to determine what your strengths are it's called it's called strengths finder it's written by um written by Tom Rath and it's a really you know it's a really short little book I don't have any um, stake in this book but I did take the test and I and I found out that I'm I'm a learner and I'm a relater uh, amongst amongst other things 
So I, I, I know what my, what my strengths are and I can work to help develop them and make my strengths even stronger and, you know, let go of your weaknesses, just surrender to them, recognize that, Hey, you know what? I, I'm never going to be good at that and let it go. You know, it's and, funny, uh, the United States military, when I got, got out of the air force, I had to take a very similar test and it was to find your strengths. And it was interesting. Yeah. I liked it. I mean, it, you know, I found out, you know, my strengths, I, I should be a lawyer or a journalist, which I was, I work, do work in the media. Um, someone that finds information because that's my skill, my skill. And I, I, I know that at work all the time, I'm very resourceful, you know, but I wouldn't maybe have identified that without having that test. You know, I might've thought about it, but that kind yeah. of pinpoint and it's very similar to that strength finders. And, and Robert Green, you know, says, he says it throughout the book. You need to know yourself and knowing yourself will allow you to better leverage your power because we all have strengths. We all have weaknesses and, and to keep an open mind too, and, and look at others in terms of strength, strength and weakness, especially in, in, you know, in the, in the, uh, the days of the court, you, if, if others knew your weaknesses, they would use that against you. You know, this is, this is a common, you know, principle in the martial arts. Um, and especially like you, when you think back, even to sword fighting, you were talking about games of throat game of thrones, you know, that whenever they were fighting, they, if, if one got the better of the other one, they would all say yield. And it's the same thing when I'm doing jujitsu and someone gets you in a point where they're either going to choke you out or, you know, break a bone, you, you say tap and it's just like crying uncle, but it allows you to get better. And, you know, you come back right. and it again. You know, if you, if you just, you know, had pride and said, no, I'm going to fight to the end, you wouldn't last very yeah. long and you would never and, get better. You know, um, I know you and I always use this term and, and there was a great uh, popular commercial about it, about, you know, sticking it to the man, you know, and kind of, kind of joke, you know, and you're like, well, aren't you the man and you're, you're sticking it to yourself? You know, it's, it's kind of funny, but, you know, most of us challenge authority and, and kind of, you know, def, try to defy authority uh, every chance we get. <laughs> I guess <laughs> I know I do, um, and, and we I, when we can argue against it and, and get angry and 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 emotional about it. But but there are personal consequences associated with with that. You know, sticking it to the man is really um, sticking it to those who have power and. W- sometimes we resent people who are, who are in power. Uh, but there could be personal consequences. Like for instance, you know, if you wanted, if you don't like your job and you want to stick it to the man, then all that means you're not going to have a job anymore. And for me, that's, that's a source of power. That's a source of income. So doing that would have a huge negative consequence to me. Um, and my, my wife would probably really (laughs) <laughs> make me sleep on the couch until I found a new job. But, um, you know, you, you can be labeled as an outcast. It could mean imprisonment or death by, you know, by trying to just stick it to the man. So I think what Robert Greene is saying is saying, take more of a subtle approach and at least on the, uh, on the outside appear to defer to authority, say, you know, Yes, sir. No, sir. No, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You know, how high, but inside be firm, be firm in your beliefs and, and don't ever give, give that up. Um, you know, be polite, but tell the truth in, in, in a way that, um, isn't presented as a challenge. You know, I, I think you can be, I, it's, it's playing with words, but, if you, this is a, a game, the, the, uh, the game of power is something that we, we all have, that, something we all play, whether we want to or not. Uh, you see it in every great movie, every TV show that has to do with two forces fighting each other. You know, you always see the villain. Of course, the villain always tells the, the hero his plan, but it's part of that power. It's part of telling, you know, it's a, it's a game. It's like a chess, chess game that they're playing. Yeah. And you know, it's funny about with the movies is that, you know, the villains never are good shots. <laughs> I mean, they could fire a gun and they couldn't hit like 
a billboard. Well, now, <laughs> my, son, I don't know why my, my son says we, we had this discussion last night because Mythbusters was on talking about Star Wars. And he says that the accuracy of the stormtroopers is not based on the stormtroopers. It's their blasters that are not accurate and, and they're, they're, they're skewed. So they have to try to compensate. <laughs> uh, that, that's just so funny, you know, to, to raise your kids and, and they have that level of understanding. Oh, yeah, I'm, getting Pat, schooled, Pat, I'm getting schooled about star Wars from my 12 year old. <laughs> But, uh, you know, getting back on track, you know, I'm not saying don't change your beliefs, you know, don't compromise your values, but do change the way you act and react to others um, and, and never argue opinion because you can't change people's opinions, especially if they're in power. You just have to surrender and, and defer to that until you and until you're in a position of power. And a, and a stronger, you know, a stronger place to argue. Um, it's 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 a, it's a strategic advantage. And, and when you, you know, in the case of work, if your boss is giving you a hard time and you, you need that paycheck, get yourself into a position to where you don't need that paycheck, and then take your stand and say, "Screw you! I'm getting the hell out of here because I own my house, I own my car, I got money in the bank," uh, you know. My rich uncle died and left me a millionaire. So I'm, I'm out of here, jerk. <laughs> um, you know, you, you know who else was a big fan of this, uh, this technique? It was Jesus. You know, he's famous for talking about turning the other cheek, right? And that's a surrender yeah. tactic. You know, it's, it's also, it's, you know, and, and I mean, you look back at, you know, Martin Luther King. You look back at Gandhi. You know, they all used this technique, but even though yeah. they were passive, they were still strong. Well, I think it's it's about putting a thought behind your actions and not just reacting to someone else's action. Because if, if you know, you know, one it, it escalates over time. One action is taken, the other person reacts, that creates more hatred, more anger, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing until... It's just way out of control. Um, and that's, you know, it, it's, it's all about applying a strategy and thinking about your actions. And often, like, like Green said, if you surrender, you, you leave your enemy kind of scratching their head saying, isn't, that, isn't he mad? <laughs> you know, kind of like when, uh, like when, uh, your friend Mike took my bike apart when I was 15. <laughs> I forgot about that. And it loosened all the, the nuts, <laughs> it loosened all the nuts and bolts on my bike. Didn't, you know, so when I went to go drive it off, the, the wheels were wobbling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that I, that's a great trick. I, you know, I, 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 I wish I would actually, I, I don't think I, I didn't surrender to that, but I, I guess I, I, I just went home and I, Tightened up to all the, all the uh, nuts and bolts and started started to work out, and <laughs> and uh, thinking that I could gain enough strength to to start a fight with him the next day. And I think it was like a one. It was a one hit fight. I mean, between he got one hit and I got one hit, and then that was it. We both walked away. I don't even remember you guys fighting. I I, I do. I, I it was it was uh, we exchanged one hit a piece and, and and then that was it and it was like okay walked away but you know my grandfather um my dad would told me the story about my grandfather and it, and it certainly applies he um it, i guess this was in the 1940s or 50s and he my grandfather went into a bar and um was talking with his friends and and this guy came up this really big guy came up and and started messing with him and my my grandfather was uh, like, you know, saying, let's let's go outside. You know, let's go outside. You want to handle this? Let's go outside and we'll fight. So they went outside. And as soon as they got outside, he says, you know, hey, listen, buddy, I was with my friends. I didn't want to, you know, appear like I was a coward. And I don't I really don't want to fight you. And, uh, you know, I, can we just, you know can I buy you a drink or something? And, uh, and the guy started to laugh. And when the guy started to laugh, my, my grandfather hauled off and just knocked him out. 
<laughs> yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, again, it was, it was, he surrendered. He basically gave in at that time. He's, he's, he, he raised the white flag, but it was just to throw him off, throw the, the, uh, the, the enemy or his opponent off guard. And, and as soon as he had the, had the chance, he let him have it. You know, I was talking about Genghis Khan um, earlier, right? Well, they, yeah. they, that's the same technique that the mongrels would use. You know, often they would say they would come to a, a city and they would say, if you surrender now, we'll let you live. If you don't, it's going to be really, really bad. And then a lot of times the people would surrender because right. of their reputation and they would kill them anyways, you know, or right. they would, they would draw, they would, the, the, the mongrels themselves would flee in terror and the armies would pursue them and scatter out, you know, and it, right. they would pursue them over hundreds of miles. And then the mongrels would lead them into like a pass where they had other mongrels waiting. And then they'd start attacking and they'd turn around and they would just annihilate the army. Because, yeah. Strategic advantage. Right? I mean, we talked about that with the United States army. I mean, as our country was forming, we, we, per, uh, we used guerrilla warfare because there was no way we could beat beat them, uh, you know, sol soldier to soldier. There was just no way to do that. And we couldn't play by their rules, so we made our own. And, and that's what I think Robert Greene is saying, is that throughout this book, we need to make our own rules and leverage whatever resources we have or, or whatever advantage we have. We have to leverage that in, in the best way possible. Um, you know, when we're talking about weakness, we're not just talking about, um, you know, the lacking strength or the condition or state of, of lacking strength. You know, it, it's also um, weakness is defined as something that as see, that's seen as a fault or a disadvantage. Um, and like I said, you know, speaking from a personal level, we can't all be good at everything. And sometimes we, we push ourselves trying to do, be somebody that we're not. And that's really just a waste of energy at, at the end if, if you either have it or you don't. And oftentimes, and that's where it comes into knowing yourself. And if you, the, the better you know yourself, the better you know your own strengths and weaknesses and can work towards building strength. Absolutely. Um, and remember, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's all relative and strength and weakness is not, is not necessarily a fact. It's, it's an opinion. Um, what's a strength, a, a, one, one person considers a strength, another person might consider weakness. Like, you know, str um, Don Henley sings it, you know, be strong enough to be weak. You know, it's it, showing emotion, uh, crying as a, as a man. You, you know, if you were a man and you, used to, and you would cry a lot, in the past, a lot of people would see that as a weakness. I think that that perception has changed and now people see that as a strength. Oh, you know, it's, I mean, I guess no one really likes a crybaby, uh, and you <laughs> be looked down as being a weak, you know, weakling. If it's you're funny, sitting around crawling, all, crying all the time. You learn that at such a young age. I would see my son go through that where he was a, a little kid, like six years old and he would not want to cry. You'd see him holding back the tears, but he would not, you know, it was like, it's okay. You know, you can, you're going to get frustrated and it's going to take time to learn how to, you know, to suppress your tears from coming out your eyes. But. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I was, I was raised not to cry. And in fact, you know, I, I talked to my dad about this uh, a long time ago and, and let him know about this and he felt terrible. But I remember a time when I was crying and he held me up in front of the mirror and basically ridiculed me. He's like, Oh, look at the little monkey crying and stuff like that. And, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, he, he didn't remember doing that, but boy, it stuck in my mind and it took a long time to, 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 you know, to kind of accept that. And, uh, I remember when my, when my grandmother died and she was an only child and I, I felt like I had to be very strong for my mom. So I didn't, didn't cry. And I was just, you know, there for my mom. And after shortly after the funeral, uh, I started developing these these major headaches, and uh, they just wouldn't go away. And I went to the doctor, and they gave me, you know, this was before Motrin was over the counter. Gave me 800 milligrams of Motrin, huge horse pill. 
I would take that pill and it would take my headache away for like, you know, five minutes and then it would come back strong. And I had, you know, x-rays and I had scans and, and, and that never went away until one day when I was driving down the road and I heard a, a song on the radio that, that reminded me of my grandmother and I just lost it. And I, I was by myself and, um, I had a, I was in the car driving and I had to actually pull over and just, I just let it all out all at once. And I'll tell you, I never had a headache after, after that. And at that, you know, that was a moment where I really learned a lot about myself and I learned the importance of showing emotion. And even though I knew that, uh, that was something I needed to work on, it was still very difficult. Um, all right, so the we're we're about done with this law. Um, yeah, the well, thing I think I think Green spoke about uh, avoiding being a martyr, and so yes, live on to fight another another day, and also don't sacrifice that. So you lose your mobility when you when you try to become a martyr, and you know basically if you're gonna die, there's nothing else you can do, right? I mean, yeah, I mean that ends the fight, right, doesn't it? Right. At least if you um, surrender, you can come back and fight again another day. You know, what, what I thought was interesting about, about his statement about martyrdom is he said it's better to, to live and wait until the power, and he, he called it, he said it was a pendulum. So he says, the, wait for the pendulum to return because eventually it will, and, and you'll, you'll be alive to see it. Because power, you know, power fades, and I mean, people grow stronger and weaker throughout their lives. Power, power shifts with time from one place to another. And if, if you're not alive to see that, you know, what's, what's the point? Because and we talked about that. This yeah. book, when this book first came out, I think it was like 1998 or 99. I remember I bought it as soon as it came out and not many people had heard about it. And it eventually let next time I saw it a few years later, it was like in the bargain bin table, you know, for like two bucks. And I wish I would have picked it up because somewhere along that line, it got popular again. Um, 50 Cent yeah. came out and, you know, I think with him writing the 50th law um, made it real popular. And and now if you try to put, get the hardcover, it's like 50 bucks. And, you know, it, it's funny because I gave away my copy to one of my bosses and uh, figured out oh, I'll, I'll go to I'll go to the store and pick up another one for a couple bucks. <laughs> and next time I saw it, I was like, holy crap, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, I, I've given away so many different books uh, to let people read. I, I never get them back. And. Yeah, but the, but the, pendulum, the pendulum swung on him. Right. So he he dipped, yep. and then it came back, and really the book became a bestseller again. Yeah, I you know I'm looking through my notes here, and uh, this might be a great way to to end this discussion, as we talk about surrendering and and um, transforming weakness into power. Um, the quote is from an Ethiopian uh, proverb. And it, I think it just says, says it all um, and, and really kind of wraps this up for us. When the great Lord passes, the wise peasant bows deeply and silently farts. <laughs> you, know, it, it, you know, think about that. You know, it, it, on, the, on the exterior, you can show that respect and, and, and bow deeply. You're passing gas, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it just that's a, such a hey, great disrespect. This is like this guy stinks, man. Yeah. But you know, don't you know? Don't give up your values. Don't give up uh, your beliefs, and, and and stop. Don't ever not be who you are. But that doesn't mean that you know deferring to authority is 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 a weakness. It, you might just not be in a position, uh, and and also recognize that. There is a cost to power, and it might feel good to to you know get up in that police officer's face and tell him how wrong he is, but they have the power to arrest you and then make your life hell and throw your ass in jail. So it's better to be respectful, be polite, and then, and then maybe pass gas as you're walking away. I don't. Know. Until next time. You know,